We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We are going to bleed over just a little bit into chapter 5 because he, the chapter break kind of cuts off his last thought. But it also is a carryover, and so next week we're going to cover the same passage. But we're going to start in chapter 4, and we'll move a little bit into chapter 5. Last week in chapter 3, you remember Paul was talking about Moses wearing a veil, and he put the veil on because he didn't want the people to see his the glory that he received from God fading. And... We talked about the law being read, and as the Jews read the law, they have a veil even to this day when they read the Scriptures, but we know that one day it will be removed. Now in chapter 4, Paul is going to use that same metaphor, that same idea, but he's going to change its application, and he's going to include us Gentiles as well. Remember that 2 Corinthians is a personal book. It's not an oratory. Paul's not answering a bunch of questions. It's not easily outlined. It's just Paul, his heart for ministry. That's what it is. So when we read through, I've got one, thank you, Daniel. When we read through 2 Corinthians, we want to take it that way. We want to apply it as a personal letter. And chapter 4 especially. Chapter 4 is extremely powerful. Every verse I could pull out and make a sermon out of. <laughs> it's just, it is a power-packed passage. And to be honest, I, uh, I will try to do my best to refrain myself, but it's just so good. <laughs> it is really good. If there's a chapter in the Bible that you really need to internalize for your personal walk, one that you would take each verse and you'd post it on your bathroom mirror, on your wall, <laughs> next to your glasses and your teeth, next to the dashboard of your car, and read and memorize and internalize. It's chapter 4, all 18 verses. You could take any one of them because they are so personal and transformational when, you, when you're able to internalize them. And I, I know it sounds like I'm over-exaggerating, but I'm really not. I'm trying not to blow it out of proportion. It's just really good. So that being said, um, I hope you're hungry. And let's start. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, through the mercy shown to us, we do not get discouraged. Instead, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use trickery or pervert God's word by clear statements of truth. We commend ourselves to everyone's conscience before God. Now what I'm going to do here is I want to read through the whole passage and then I'm going to go back because normally I'll read through a section, a paragraph, two or three verses and then talk about it, but We're going to be going right straight through them. So I I want to read the whole chapter so that you get the the feel of it. And then we'll come back to it. Verse 3. So if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are dying. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe to keep them from seeing the light of the glorious gospel of the Messiah who is in the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but rather Jesus, the Messiah, as Lord, and ourselves as merely your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus, the Messiah. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in clay jars to show that its extraordinary power comes from God and not from us. In every way we're troubled, but we're not crushed. We're frustrated, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We're always carrying around the death of Jesus in our bodies so that the life of Jesus may be clearly shown in our bodies. While we are alive, we are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake. For that, 
for that the life of Jesus may be clearly shown in our mortal bodies. And so death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith in keeping with the this scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise with Jesus and present us to God together with you. All this is for your sake so that as his grace spreads, more and more people will give thanks in glorifying God. Excuse me, and glorify God. That's why we're not discouraged. No, even if our outwardly we are wearing out, inwardly we are being renewed each and every day. This light, temporarily, temporary nature of our suffering is producing for us in an everlasting weight of glory, far beyond any comparison. But because we do not look for things that can be seen, but for those things that can't be seen. For things that can be seen are temporary, but things that cannot be seen are eternal. Chapter 5, verse 1. We know that if the earthly tent we live in is torn down, we have a building in heaven that comes from God, an eternal house not built by human hands. For in this one we sigh, since we long to put on our heavenly dwelling, of course, if we do put it on, we will not be found without a body. So while we are still in this tent, we sigh under our burdens because we do not want to put it off, but put it on so that our dying bodies may be swallowed up by life. God has prepared us for this and has given us his spirit as a guarantee. So let's go back to verse one. Ooh. You don't want to see my notes. He starts off by therefore. And like J. Vernon McGee says, <laughs> whenever you see a therefore, you got to go and find out what it's there for. And what it's there for is Paul is talking in chapter 3 about his ministry. That God gave him a ministry with this new covenant of the gospel. One that gives life and does not give death like the Old Testament. When we go to Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, we realize that this same message that Paul has isn't just for the preachers. In the Great Commission, Jesus says it's for all of us. So when we start down this path that Paul is going to talk about, we have to understand that this is for all of us. We all have a ministry. God has placed us exactly where He wants us in the way that He has created us so that he can use us right where we're at. But the problem is, when you start being used by God, you're impacting the world around you. Guess who doesn't like it? <laughs> the prince of this world. And troubles are going to come up. And he's going to fight you. So what do you do in those times when the devil's fighting you? Well, this passage is exactly what's being talked about. So as we come through this, I want you to keep in mind all of the things that Paul went through. I mean, the stonings, the beatings, the shipwreck. I mean, being beheaded, <laughs> finally. He went, it was his entire life was, or excuse me, his entire ministry was wrought with people fighting him. People trying to kill him. <laughs> people discrediting him. I mean, he went through a lot of suffering. He did a lot for God's ministry. To be an ambassador of Christ. So as we go through, I want you to think about all that he went through. But then I also want you to take these words and understand when the devil's fighting us, apply what Paul applied and we'll endure it. Okay, so verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, through the mercy shown to us, we do not get discouraged. Instead, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use trickery or pervert God's word. By clear statements of truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience before God. You and I are called to do our homework, 
to know what the Scripture says, and then to share what we know. You don't share what you don't know, but you share what you do know. But you also do it genuinely, transparently. None of us are perfect, and when we go to put a mask on, everybody sees right past it. What you do behind closed doors is usually seen through the windows of your house. <laughs> Every secret that you have is going to come out. Scripture tells us that. So, we live transparent lives as the most holy people we possibly can in every situation of life. And then when we share the gospel, people see it. They see that, yep, <laughs> he's got some cracks, but there's something on the inside that's different. Verse 3. So if our gospel is veiled, remember he was talking about it being veiled for the Jews. He said, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In case the God of this world, who's that? <laughs> Satan, right? In case the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe to keep them from seeing the light of this glorious gospel of the Messiah, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but rather Jesus the Messiah as Lord, and ourselves as merely your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul says Satan's real. He's not just a figment of somebody's imagination. He's not a concept of evil. He's a real person. Him and his minions will do their best to blind anyone they can and convince them to follow in their evil ways. John chapter 12, verse 31. John chapter 14, verse 30. John chapter 16, verse 11. Uh, by the way, have any of you ever read the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis? Excellent book. If you are interested in reading it, it's not terribly long. It's written like a story form. It's really easy to read. I have it, and I would be glad to let you borrow it and read it. It's fantastic, but it talks about this. Would you? Okay. It's, it's a great read. I'll, I'll bring it. If it's not in the back, it's at home, and I'll bring it. Um, but the idea is the lost are blind. Without the impact of the Holy Spirit to teach them, they cannot understand it's impossible. It's not an issue. It's not an idea of intellectual failures. It's a spiritual warfare. Kind of like what we talked about last Sunday, and I've got it here. When you have your human spirit, what is being produced is human and fleshly and selfish. And you are blind to the things of the Spirit. You need your spirit changed before you can receive anything from God. That's, it's, it is a spiritual warfare. And we're going to deal with it in chapter 10. But 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For, we walk, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It's a spiritual warfare, not an intellectual one. And so we pray. And we pray more. <laughs> and we pray with all of our might that the Holy Spirit would continue to reach down to their heart and remove their blindness. It, it really bugs me when I give a Bible study or a sermon and I put it down, I mean kids level, anybody can understand it, and then they walk away and they're like, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. The reason that's the case is because Satan and his minions have blinded their eyes. And the things of this world that they are involved in have blinded their eyes from the truth. We can't break through that. As hard as a pastor tries, I can't break that veil. 
but the Holy Spirit can rip it right in half. And so if I don't pray before my sermons or Bible studies, it may never have an effect. If we don't pray before our services, if we don't pray before talking to someone about their soul, we probably won't be making an impact. That's bad enough. But you know what drives me even more crazy than that? Is when I do a Bible study or a sermon and I get it down to base level for so anybody can understand and I have believers who have God's Spirit walk away not understanding a thing I said. The reason that bugs me more than anything is they have the right spirit, but they're still being blinded by the world around them because of the junk that they still keep themselves in. What a terrible thing. We need the work of the Holy Spirit, whether it, they're unsaved or whether we are saved. Let's face it, we're all blind to some of the things in our life, right? We've all got our own failures. And it takes the work of God to remove those blinders. And so we pray that way. And we pray hard that way because, again, it's not an intellectual battle. This is a spiritual one. Verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus the Messiah. Paul is speaking to Romans and Jews and Greeks who live in a Greek society. You, they'll call it Hellenistic in educated terms, but it's, it's a Greek society, and you've got Romans, Jews, and Greeks, all three of them. For the Romans... Their life goal, their ultimate objective in life was glory. Whether it was in battles, whether it was power, whether it was riches, they wanted glory. And we even talk about it. When we talk about the ancient Roman Empire, we talk about the glorious Roman Empire. They, their goal was glory. The Greeks... They were all about gaining knowledge and wisdom. It would be nothing out of the ordinary to be walking down the street and seeing people talk about politics and religion and social issues just on the street corner. Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, the greatest philosophical minds of ancient times were all Greek. They wanted knowledge and wisdom. And the Jews, they wanted light. All through the Old Testament, you see the contrast between light and dark. Even back to chapter 1, right? God said, let there be light, and there was light. They wanted the understanding. They were supposed to pierce the darkness. They were supposed to make the darkness escape. They looked for light. So what does Paul say to that group of Romans, Greeks, and Jews? Look what he says. For God said, let light shine out of darkness. So in other words, hey, this is what light's supposed to do. It's supposed to come out of the darkness. It's supposed to illuminate. It's supposed to stand out. It's supposed to expel the darkness. <laughs> but then he says, that light that came out of the darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus the Messiah. The Romans looked for glory. <laughs> the Greeks looked for knowledge. The Jews looked for light. And he says, folks, <laughs> the light shines out of darkness. And guess what it tells you? Everything you're looking for is found in the face of Jesus. Man, that's a sermon all by itself. Everything you're looking It's the same thing we tell everyone. Even in our day today, you're looking, you're, you're trying to find in the darkness, you're, you're, you're desperately seeking fulfillment in areas of your life. And it always just seems out of grasp. But I got a clue for you. Every fulfillment you're looking for in life, you can find in the face of Jesus. Whew. 
That's a good sermon. Anyways, all right, verse 7. So we've got this wonderful message. We've got this wonderful sermon, verse 6, and look what it says. But we have this treasure, this wonderful message, this wonderful sermon, this great power in clay jars. <laughs> and that word for clay jars is literally, it's, it's the dollar general clay jars. It's not good china. No, it's the throwaway clay. This is the Walmart brand of Tupperware. <laughs> It's nothing that you're going to keep around. It, you don't care if you lose it. You don't care if you break it. It's kind of worthless. And Paul says, we have this wonderful treasure, this most expensive treasure, and it's in a bunch of cracked pots, to show that the extraordinary power comes from God and not from us. It's not about the jar. It's not about the container that makes it valuable. When pirates go out to look for treasure, they're not looking for the treasure box. They're looking for the treasure inside the box. I buy a lot of Veil 8. <laughs> I don't buy it because of the beautiful green bottle that it comes in. I, I buy it because I love drinking the wonderful honey nectar that comes from the bottle. <laughs> it's what's inside the bottle that makes it valuable to me. But if we try, you and I, to show off the bottle, it's all about me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. And Greg <laughs> cuts it out for Lent today, and I'm talking about LA. If I try to share the bottle, that it's my looks, it's the way I preach. It's how good of a saint I am. And I give that to people as wonderful as that may look and as thirsty as they may be. It's going to be empty and they're going to be left thirsty. I know I had a piece of paper here, so it dripped on the paper. <laughs> I, that was for emphasis. <laughs> it's going to be empty. Because it's not about the jar. It's about the message that the jar has inside it. God formed us in our mother's womb. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. He had formed us exactly how He wanted us so that we can do the job that He has for us. He's the potter forming us exactly the way He wants. Jeremiah chapter 13, verses 2 through 6 imperfections and all. Doesn't that drive us nuts? He has designed us imperfections and all just the way He wants so that we can say it's not us, but it's Him. We would love to say, God, why did you make me like this? <laughs> Why couldn't I better be a better organizer or a better leader? Or why couldn't I say my words properly like Moses said? Romans chapter 9, verses 19 through 24. But he's the potter. And he knows what he wants you to be. This is so hard for me. I'm so type A personality. If I see something wrong, especially in me, I want to fix it. And I try and I try and I try. <laughs> and many times I do pretty well and then I fail. And I do pretty well and then I fail. All the while God says, why don't you let me form you? I started the work in you. I have started forming you on the wheel. Why don't you let me finish the job? <laughs> But Lord, I, I, I. <laughs> and God says, no. It's me, me, me that can change you. I've designed you the way I wanted you to be. And to be honest, look at Paul's testimony here. <laughs> I mean, can any of it? 
all that Paul went through for the ministry. And this is what Paul says. I got blessed when I started reading this one this week. Paul says, in every way we're troubled, but we're not crushed. We're frustrated, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're never abandoned. We're struck down. Literally, that means we are thrown down, but we're not destroyed. God, I'm weak. And Satan's pressing me on every side. But God has never let him crush me once. God, I'm frustrated about this. But you know what? I've never lost hope. When it has felt like no one else is with me, when I'm serving all alone, he never left me. He never left me. When things haven't gone my way, when what I've worked on seems to be crumbling around me, or when people have attacked me, He never let me be destroyed. Hallelujah! When we do ministry, when we try to impact people's lives, it gets messy and it gets hard and it gets difficult and there's problems. But you know what? He's never let us be destroyed. He's never abandoned us. He's never let us be crushed. Verse 10, we are always carrying around the death of Jesus in our bodies. <laughs> Everywhere we go, every message we preach, we're dragging Jesus on the cross with us. What a picture. Paul, we start preaching about the Messiah dying on the cross, about God dying on the cross. It's insanity to the world. Come follow my God. He died. That's what we're saying. What? I mean, the logical thing, the logical question that comes from that, why would I want to follow your God if he's dead? Now, for you and I as believers, without the veil... We know that it's only because of Jesus dying on the cross, paying the penalty for our sin, that we have salvation. But for a dying world that's veiled, why would you want to follow a God that dies? That's the logical question. And look at Paul's logical answer. Another sermon. So that the life of Jesus may be clearly shown in our bodies. We dragged the dead body of Jesus everywhere on that cross with us. So that when they ask, why would I want to follow a God that's dead? We say, because he lives, I live also. And guess what? You can too. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Amen. What a sermon. <laughs> Way to go, Paul. What a treasure. Inside a cracked pot verse 11 while we are alive we are constantly being ha handed over to death for jesus sake so that the life of jesus may be clearly shown in our mortal bodies and so death is at work in us but life is at work in you you know the greatest testimony to the world is not our oratories it's not the good things we do. It's not what we do on Sundays and Wednesdays. It's not what we do with our money. The greatest testimony to the world around us is the sacrifice we make for the gospel. The willing sacrifice we make for the gospel. It's the greatest testimony. People would look at Paul's life. Paul, you are nuts. Why in the world do you endure such? Why are you willing to be beaten and then go back into town? Why are you willingly going to Rome when you know you're going to die there? Because 
what I have inside of me to share with you is worth that sacrifice. The greatest testimony to the world is what we willingly sacrifice for the gospel. The phrase is, right? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The places where the greatest persecution in the world is taking place is the places of greatest revival. Iran and China right now, the church is growing gangbusters. Because they see the sacrifice that people are willing to make and they say there's got to be something to this. Maybe that's the reason so few have found our testimonies to be valid inside the United States. Because we have the idea if we show up on a Sunday or Wednesday, we throw a few coins in the plate, we've done our job. And we've made no sacrifice at all for the gospel. If our gospel really meant something to us, we would be willing to do whatever it takes to share have you ever seen that video of uh, Penn, the magician Penn and Teller? He, uh, Penn is the bigger guy with, uh, with the dark hair. He's the one that's always speaking. And they do a comedy routine, and um, sometimes it's a little vulgar. And so I would caution you if you go to watch it. But Penn is an atheist. And he did a personal home video just on his phone. And he was choked up and he was crying because after one of his shows somebody came up to him and said I love your comedy you do a great job I, lo I love the, the magicians the tricks it's great he said but I want to tell you I'm worried about your soul Jesus loves you and if you die the way you are you're going to go to hell and he gave him a bible and you'd think this atheist would be mocking and he said no he said, I respect him because he told it. He is, I don't agree with him, but he's completely convinced that if I died and go, went to hell, that would be my ultimate position. And he said, he believed it so much he was willing to put himself vulnerable for me. And he said, I can accept that. He, and I, I wish I could quote it exactly, but he said something to the effect, how much do you have to hate a person? if you truly believe that hell exists, to not tell them a way to escape it. And that was coming from an atheist. The greatest testimony the world can ever see is how much we're willing to sacrifice for the gospel. Verse 14. Paul is going to begin in this next passage and... You can see the verses there. But he's going to begin in his next passage from 14 on through chapter 5, verse 5. His secret for endurance. And it's something that we need to remember. In chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 14, he says this. And this is number 1 of the 4. We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to God together with you. The reason I can endure all of that, the reason I can put sacrifice to God's gospel is because I know we will win. When Jesus is raised, we will be raised with him and Jesus will present us to the Father. The reason I can make sacrifices is because, you know what, we're going to win. If you've ever been in a ball team <laughs> and you come up against a really hard opponent, it's going to do one of two things with you. You're either going to play harder because you think you can beat them, or you're going to play weaker because you know you can't. My cousin was in the Junior World Olympics for fencing. And he got to play, he got to fence one of the men that actually represented the United States in the Olympics. 
And I was asking my uncle about it. And he said he could have won. But when he saw who it was, in his mind, he believed that he couldn't. His technique was better. His movement was better. He could have won and made it to the Olympics. But he lost because his mind fought him out of it. We can make all kinds of extra sacrifices if we know we're going to win. And Paul says, so I remember that. Then in verse 15, he says, All this is for your sake, so that his grace spreads more and more people will give thanks and glorify God. All of the sacrifices we make, we do it because we know we're going to win. But we also do it because we know God will get glory from it. Across the board, everyone will see God is doing something in this fool. Because <laughs> he's something different. We make all kinds of sacrifices because we're not trying to show ourselves up, but we are trying to show Jesus. We want him to get the glory. Verses 16 and 17. He says, that's why we're not discouraged. No, even if outwardly we are wearing out. You know what was wearing him out? Beatings, stonings, and eventually an axe. He said, even though bodily we are wearing out, inwardly we are being renewed each and every day. <laughs> Listen how he says this. This light, temporary nature of suffering is producing for us an everlasting weight of glory far beyond any comparison. <laughs> Yeah, they, they stoned me and they left me for dead. It was rather light, though. I got back up and I went back into town. Started preaching again. They ran me out of this city, but it was light. It was no big deal. Oh, boy, Paul. <laughs> the sacrifices we make. Do you see how he looked at the, the, the suffering that he faced? Look at his comparison. He said, this light is compared to the weight of glory. This light suffering will be a weight of glory. And he said, this suffering is temporary, but the glory will be everlasting. He said, I can endure, I can suffer, I can struggle, I can push through, I can endure because I know God will use our hardships for good. Like we talked about last week, remember? Everything we go through is Father filtered. Whatever we go through, He uses for our good so that we can bless others. And as we bless others, they go through sufferings and then God helps them and it's a continual cycle. We can endure because we know the things that we go through, God will use for our good. And then finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 18 through 5, 5, he says, well, let me read. I hate how they break up verses and then they break them up in the middle of a sentence. It drives me nuts. So I'm going to read 17, even though I've already read it, all right? One of those that's just a pet peeve of mine. This light temporary nature of suffering is producing for us an everlasting weight of glory far beyond any comparison because we do not look for the things that can be seen out of things that cannot be seen for the things that can be seen are temporary but the things that cannot be seen are eternal we know that if the earthly tent we live in is torn down, we have a building in heaven that comes from God, an eternal house not built by human hands. For this one we sigh, since we, since we long to put on our heavenly dwelling. Of course, if we do put it on, we will not be found without a body. So while we are still in this tent, 
We sigh under our burdens because we do not want to put it off, but to put it on so that our dying bodies may be swallowed up by life. God has prepared us for this and has given us his spirit as a guarantee. Number four, his last one, our hope is eternal. As Paul looked out, (laughs) yep, what I'm going through, it may be light. (laughs) I got stone left for dead. It may be light, but what's coming is even better. And boys, if you kill me off, eh, I'm putting on a new body. (laughs) This one's not going to be all broken and messed up. (laughs) That thorn in my flesh will finally be gone. And I get to have it for eternity. Our hope is eternal. As I read through this, I thought the Lord gave me an idea. And I thought of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. And in it, he says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. He says, you know, right now, we don't have good eyesight. We can't see very well. We're looking in the in eternity and it looks like a, a foggy, dirty window. But one of these days, God's going to wipe that window clean. I'll be able to see real colors. Woo-hoo! <laughs> I won't be colorblind anymore. I won't have to wear contacts anymore. He said... I know in part, man, I wish I could know it all. I, I study the word and I forget bunches of notes when I'm going through them, probably for y'all's benefits so you don't fall asleep on me. But I wish I could just read it and engulf it. But I only know in part. But one of these days, this old mind isn't going to be a hindrance anymore. But what triggered this thought was what he said in the passage that we read. And now abide. What tense is that? Present tense. It says now abide, present tense, faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. That passage led me to another passage in 1 Peter. Chapter 3. It says, "Blessed." uh, 1 Peter, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Messiah. Because of his great mercy, he has granted us a new birth, resulting in an immortal hope. The last passage said that hope abides, present tense. This says our hope is immortal through the resurrection of Jesus the Messiah from the dead and to an inheritance kept in heaven for you that can't be destroyed, corrupted, or changed. Through faith, you have been protected by God's power for a salvation that is ready to be revealed at the end of this era. You greatly rejoice in this, even though you have to suffer various kinds of trials for a little while. So that your genuine faith, which is more valuable than gold that perishes when tested by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus the Messiah is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. Because you are receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls. Here's where I'm going with this. I want us to just see it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 says, but the things that we cannot see are eternal. The hope that he had, through the sufferings that he had now, everything out there is better. It's hopeful. It's glorious. It's wonderful. And I can endure what I'm facing now because I know what's ahead of me. Then, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, he's writing to the same people. In an earlier letter, he said, Now abide faith, hope, and love. Faith, or excuse me, hope is abiding. 
The things that are out there, that's a hopeful looking towards eternity. Here, his faith is, or excuse me, his hope is currently with him, but it stays with him. And then, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, we have an immortal hope. Our hope is eternal. It's timeless. It's never ending. It's always abiding, never dying. You see, the struggles that we face in this life are no comparison to what God has waiting for us in heaven as a reward. If God rewards everything we do, down even to a cup of cold water in His name, can you imagine what He's going to reward you with with the sufferings that you face in this life? It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be wonderful. But that's not all. Let's just say God makes a deal with each one of us. Okay, Somewhere in the Scriptures or maybe in prayer time, God says, I'm going to tell you what. Every cup of cold water you give in my name, I will add one brick to your mansion in heaven. That sounds like a pretty good deal. We'd be, man, we'd be out throwing water at people. We'd be putting holy water, just splashing people as they go by. And in the name of Jesus, in the name, I mean, you know, all over the place. We'd be Benny Hinn, except with bottles of water, just going, right? Because we know that if Jesus keeps his word, man, I'm, when we get to heaven, that mansion's going to be massive. That's great. And you know what? Although that's not the, you know, it's only an illustration. That's exactly what he says he's going to do. He says, I'm going to reward everything that you have done for me. I'm not going to miss anything. But even that thought is shy of what Paul is talking about here. You see, he said that our hope is eternal, timeless, never ending, always abiding, never dying. So don't let me lose you here, okay? Stick with me. What we just mentioned, that deal, is temporary. If we made that kind of deal with God that He's going to give us a brick every time we give somebody a cup of cold water, we get up to heaven and He gives us that brick and the deal is done. God kept to His word, we kept to ours. You sign the paper, you write the receipt. It's all done, right? That's temporary. But what Paul is talking about here is eternal. Our hope is eternal, timeless, never ending, always abiding, never dying. Rather inconceivably, going back to that illustration, our hope is that we get one gold brick per cup. But that's not all. Because if our hope is eternal... That means we're going to be hoping for a better deal next time, further down the road, perpetually. Am I making sense? Am I clearing with you? I wish I could put in the words what I'm trying to say. But even in heaven, our hopes for the future will be of something greater and better. Anything less than that and our hope is dead. Our hope, we come to the agreement and it's done. Forgive me for using the word, the, the song. That This is the idea. It's getting better all the time. <laughs> getting better all the time. You know. That's the idea of this hope that Paul is talking about. It is a hope that continues to get better. We think, man, we make it across the, the earthly spectrum into the heavenly and we've made it to heaven. Whoo, we're here, finish line. But that's not all. It perpetually gets better. We're perpetually hoping for more and we receive more. We do more. We experience more. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul said, No eye has seen. No ear has heard, 
No mind has even imagined the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Our hope isn't just that we cross the finish line and we get a reward. Our hope is one that stays with us even into and through eternity. And our minds can't even wrap around what that will be. No wonder Paul could say, <laughs> this light affliction will make for me an eternal, everlasting weight of glory. So if you want to endure through the struggles that you're currently in, here's one through four. Remember that we will win. Remember that God will get glory from what we're going through. Remember that no matter what we face, God will use those hardships for our good. And our hope is eternal. Always growing. Forever. Spanning all time into eternity. There isn't anything in this life that we could endure. We could have the most miserable in that little fraction of it. And then all eternity, we won't even think about it. Let's pray. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. It really does mean the world to me that you're getting a blessing out of it. If this video was a blessing, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for me. That way other people can find it as well. Here in the link section, you'll find playlists and new videos that we put out. We try to do two or three a week. You can also subscribe to the channel uh, by pressing on my face and then hitting the bell icon and that will alert you to new videos. May God richly bless you.